Harvey Leeds? Yes. Okay, here we are. Um, this is taking a while. I'm here with Bobby Mahoney. Hey, Harvey, how are you? Bobby Mahoney, live Saturday night, 8 o'clock. Yes, sir. 740. Outside Johnny. Yeah, it's going to be fun. Thanks for having me. Hey. Yeah, thanks for having me. And what, who is that you have with you on your right hand today? Well, this is my newest artist. Um, it's called Chimp. <laughs> Coming out on Columbia Records soon. Um, no, I just wanted to make sure we were, you know, weren't monkeying around. Okay. That makes sense. We're, we're. That makes sense. Um, their music, Chimp. The music of Chimp sounds a lot like Gorillas. So. Yes. Uh, it's electronic. All right, so we have a class. We have a music, uh, William Patterson University uh, social media in music, actually it's music and social media class, hanging out with us, watching this. Bobby Mahoney's on your left, my right. Uh, Bobby's opening up for Southside Johnny at William Patterson University this coming Saturday. And I'm Dave Philp, the co-host of the Music Biz 101 and More radio show, which takes place most Wednesdays on WPSC Brave New Radio, and we're talking today with Harvey Leeds, who's a personal manager for Southside Johnny, Black Violin, Mark and Ramon, and others. So, Harvey, thank you very much for being here today. My pleasure. Technology is a wonderful thing. Yes, this hangout only started 14 minutes late, so, <laughs> um, but we got it going. So, the most important thing is that it worked. We didn't give up, did we, Harvey? Nope, and that's what the music business is about. If it's you just... believe, never give up. In your career, how many times did you say, or would, do you think a lot of people would have just given up? Well, I would, I would say every time because you know, I worked 35 years doing uh, touring and marketing and promotion at Epic Records, Sony Music, and you know, people will tell you, "Oh, Pearl Jam." Well, let me tell you something. For about a year, no one wanted to play Pearl Jam, and I can go back and tell you those stories. Whether it was Living Color, Cindy Lauper, Rage Against the Machine, The Fray, Sarah Bareilles, you know, I mean, I'll go back to Boston. I'll go back to Meatloaf, The Clash, you know, Bruce Springsteen. No one wanted to play Bruce Springsteen, you know. Um, if you believe in it, you you just keep pounding away. Because the only musical barrier is the media. Because you uh, were with Columbia Records and then... You... Well, no, I was with Epic Records, but in the last couple of years I oversaw the touring uh, divisions of both Epic Records and Columbia. Okay. And then from there, is that when you became a personal manager? And now I know you're also a part-time with Live Nation, right? Well, I'm a consultant to the Live Nation New York office. Um, you know, I, I guess doing promotion and artist development at Sony, you almost were an extension of a manager the whole time because you worked very closely with the artist and the managers. You know, when no one wanted to play Meatloaf or The Clash or Pearl Jam or Rage Against the Machine, you shared and worked on the same uh, ideas and and. and, and frustrations that any manager would work on. So that kind of set me up so that when I retired from Sony, when I when I, uh, re I retired for 20 minutes and said, this really sucks, and I hooked up with an old friend of mine, Amanda Palmer, from the Dresden Dolls, and she was one of my first clients, and, and Newfound Glory, and I was like, oh, now I'm a manager, and I, and I thought I knew, but you don't know anything until you get into the trenches. And what are some of the things that you discovered that you didn't know? Well, every, everything from the dynamics of touring and just branding an artist and, and pounding through. I mean, the best thing for the music industry and any new artist is the Internet. And the worst thing is the internet because it let anyone and everyone and made the space so crowded that you have to figure out how to pound through, you know, and and trying to get your message across because 
it's more important than ever that an artist, which really is a brand, has to bang through the clutter. So when you think about watching television, what are the commercials that you remember the most? And when you listen to the radio, what stands out the most? And when you're marketing and, and touring and, and selling merchandise and putting your shows up for sale, what are you doing to break through so you're not just one of 100 bands, excuse me, one of 10,000 bands at South by Southwest? What do you think it, it takes for a band or an artist to stand out. Is it looking into yourself and finding, you know, what, what is unique about me that I'm very passionate about that I can uh, tell a great story about? Or, or I'm sure there's no special sauce that here add water and you stand out. What are some of the things that you've Well, seen? actually, if that you brought up the <laughs> oh. There's the special <laughs> sauce. <laughs> and it's the Marky Ramon pasta sauce. And this Google Hangout is being brought to you by Marky Ramon's Pasta Sauce. You've tried the rest, now try the best. Um, okay, well, I mean, there is no magic sauce. I mean, look, you have to have great music, great songs. I mean, Clive Davis, you know, was the master at finding great songs. He resurrected so many old artists, you know, whether it was Aretha Franklin, or, you know, all of a sudden branded Rod Stewart to become a pruner. Or, you know, if you think about Whitney Houston, you know, that first record that she had, I Will Always Love You, was a country record, you know, that he took and and that started off the magnificent career of, of, of Whitney. So it comes down to a song. After the song, then it's like what distinguishes you and makes you unique from all the other artists, bands, singers, songwriters, crooners, whatever. I, I'm, I'm, yeah, listening. Bobby, do you have anything at this point? Oh, um, I mean, the question I thought was you told us to prepare a question was, I know last time we talked about uh, different kinds of merch and different, you know, outside the box kind of things like the Mark Moon pasta sauce or the Asbury Jukes uh, fly swatter. Has there been, a, like, a piece of merch that you came up with like an you know, outside the box idea that didn't really take off, and if so, why? Uh, that's a good question. Um, yeah, I've made a lot of crappy, you know, T-shirts that didn't sell, but you know, um, nah, I can't think of something that was other than making a T-shirt that didn't sell. You know, I've been you know, pretty lucky because I, you know, I'm the king of tchotchkes. I always believe that motivational devices, uh, which is what, you know, when you go to the merch counter, you know, how do you attract attention and get people to buy your band and all its ancillary tchotchkes and merch and stuff? So, so what is what goes through your head? Are you thinking quality of the of the tchotchke of the of the merch? Are you thinking of value for the person who's going to spend money on this? Are you thinking of um, I, I want to create something that people will actually use? What what do you think, or is it case by case each time? Well, for example, like you brought up the Southside Johnny Fly Swatter. You know, I wanted to sell something that was three dollars. You didn't have to spend twenty five dollars for for a t shirt. Or I was on vacation and I saw. A keychain, uh, bottle opener, little pocket flashlight. I was like, well, that's a cool thing. That's useful. If I could put, you know, my artist in your pocket every day, and you know, you put your key on it, and you every time you open up a bottle of beer, and then if you need a little flashlight, I'm in your pocket. That's you know, I mean, you know, I mean, the master at selling stuff is Gene Simmons and Kiss. I mean, he's done everything from, you know, coffins to ketchup to telephones to credit cards. Yeah, so it's, okay, so you're looking for something um, that, that people can use. You know, the fly swatter, there are flies. The, <laughs> the keychain, uh, the idea of the, of the mini flashlight can work because you never know when you're going to have a power outage or you never know when it's going to become night, which happens, like, every day. So you're you're looking for that kind of thing. Yeah, I, I want when it comes to merch, I'm looking for useful stuff. 
Right. You know, everybody makes a T-shirt, but you know, and, and and everybody makes you know a customized flash drive. You know, I I just tried a really silly idea that Southside Johnny will probably fire me for, but there there were you know uh, politically correct bamboo cutting boards for your kitchen, and there's one in the state of it's in the shape of the state of New Jersey, and and just thinking a little out of the box and off the screen, it's, uh, you know, we put the Asbury Jukes logo on it. Yeah, I don't know if anyone's going to care. Or the band that I have, the artist, you know, Black Violin. We get a lot of musicians that play violin that come to our shows. We just started making some, you know, rosin for your, you know, for your bow, for your cello or your, your violin. I, I can't think of any artist that has sold their own custom rosin. Yeah, you know, and it was like, and the, what we know about any musician who plays a string instrument and uses rosin, that stuff stays with you for years. So it's trying to find something that, you know, is unique. You know, it's like, just to show you how I think, like when we did the Marky Ramon sauce. Well, everybody said, ah, oh, you know, tomato sauce with pasta. Well, in Israel and in Greece and in Italy, they eat eggs for breakfast that are poached in tomato sauce. So it's like, in just trying to brand and think differently, how do I get you to eat tomato sauce besides having it for pasta in a meal? And we put a recipe on here how to poach eggs and put it over spinach. And it was just trying to find, you know, I, I, and I was using a radio mentality of like, how do I get you to use a product and in another day part? Because that's how radio thinks. It's like, hey, if I can get you to listen to the morning show, how do I keep you so you listen to afternoon drive and my nighttime jock? And that, and that was just me using old philosophy. How do I get you to use something other than at night with pasta? You know, and that's how you have to think. You know, that's great. One other thing you brought up was you had mentioned in terms of the all the different things specifically for Southside John you have the t-shirts that you said are selling for 20 bucks but you were looking for something to sell that would cost three bucks so it's you're you're looking at that small little tchotchke to sell as part of a larger sort of breadth of plan that you have around the whole merch you, you're, you're planning this out you're not just oh I think I want to do this today right yeah hey, look I, you know it, it goes back to you know, why do why do we have, you know, why do I make, you know, a dollar bumper sticker for all my artists? I, I believe in bumper stickers, you know. I believe in stickers all over the place. Yeah, so we've been doing stickers lately, and that's been something that people, you know, like we give them, usually give them away at shows, you know, a little sticker, and people really like those, and I've been seeing them around more, more and more different venues and whatnot, people putting them up and giving them to their friends and whatnot. So those are definitely like, a good tool. Like for black, for black violin and some other artists I have, you know, we make tattoos. You can make like 3,000 tattoos for like 150 bucks, you know, water tattoos. And you can give them away for free. You know, it's, I want people putting their name on, you know, their forehead or arm. You know, I want them to think about my my artist, twenty four seven. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Um, we have a couple questions for you that that have been tweeted over, and we have a number of people who are watching. And feel free, those of you who are watching, to tweet us a question about any of the stuff that we're talking about at Music Biz WP. And um, one from Cole uh, at Cole underscore Slaw. <laughs> uh, being the artist manager for a band like Black Violin, what responsibilities does that entail? Well, uh, starting finding the proper agent to get you live dates, um, everything from making sure they have an organization on the road so they have. Uh, a tour manager and other musicians. Uh, in the case of Black Violin, we they had their own records out on their own label. We we got them a deal with um, Universal Music. Um, 
talking to their music publishers, making sure that there's licensing opportunities. Again, making sure that their merchandise. They, I mean, they they had a website that was you know pretty inactive, and you know we're now selling thousands of dollars a month of merchandise and collecting uh, data and emails. Uh, it's building them, and in the case of Black Violin, they spent nine years pretty much playing the Performing Arts Center, and we call it soft tickets, where schools brought you know hundreds of kids. Like in November, we played at Brooklyn College, um, two shows a day, two days, eight thousand kids. But that's a soft ticket, so we said, well, let's see what happens if we put up a hard ticket. And we sell tickets to a real audience other than kids coming from schools and performing arts centers. And we sold 1,500 tickets. So that the, the game changer for Black Violin is turning the corner, going from performing arts center and call it soft tickets into a hard ticket act. They'd never played San Francisco and, and last Saturday night sold out Yoshi's. They'd never played Chicago. They sold out the city winery. So we know that it's connecting in and building into a, a real, you know, fan base that will pay money to come see them in a real venue and not a performing arts center, you know, under the guise of a school. Okay. Um, Tim Geisen wants to know, at Tim Geisen Music, that's Geisen with a G-Y-S-I-N, how difficult is it to work with artists that differ from a Southside Johnny to a black violin? They're, they're different artists. Do you do different things with them because of the genre of music? Or in general, the, uh, the path is the same. You just have to deal with different people within that path because of the varying genres. No, it's all, every artist is different. I, um, the only common thread is you know finding live opportunities with the right booking agents you know, and helping you with touring, but everything else is unique to each artist. I mean, Black Violin has nothing to do with Marky Ramone, which has nothing to do with Southside Johnny, which has nothing to do with City of the Sun, which has nothing to do with a great band I have called Glint, G-L-I-N-T, which you'll be hearing things about. So it's, no, it's, other than the touring, which is always different too, but everything is unique to the artist. Okay, and I'm sure um, people watching are, are wondering because everybody wants to make it and they want to make it now. And I think a good point you brought up was how Black Violin, they were doing this for nine years before they got to where they are now. And you had mentioned you got them the, the deal with the uh, Universal Music Group. But what, um, what do you do if I'm asking you a question and I forget the question? I, can't, I try and think of a new question. I completely thought what I was Bobby's going to ask you a question. Yeah, here, here's a quiz. What's this? I don't know. You got this down. A, a, a phone, a smile, a brooch, a banana. Oh, I think you're, yeah. A banana. Okay, uh, now when you think of a banana, let's go down this path. This is a banana. What's the first thing? Banana. Who makes bananas? What, what's the biggest banana brand? Chiquita or Dole. Dole, yeah. Correct. Okay, bingo. And that brings us and opens the door to branding. Every artist ha is a brand. And when you see a banana, you think of either Dole or Chiquita. So, you know, w when you see certain logos, whether it's, you know, the V and the H for Van Halen, or, you know, I could just show you the cover to London Calling by The Clash, you know, you just you have to brand yourself. Like Southside Johnny, for 40 years, that that script Asbury Jukes is, you know, he, it's 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 one of the greatest brands, or the Ramones, one of the greatest brands, the Beatles, one of the greatest brands, the Rolling Stones, the tongue sticking out of you, the tongue is one of the greatest logos, and and, and brands ever. Okay. So it's about branding your your yourself and your music. I remembered my question because sometimes I talk too much. Um, the, people, the people watching, I'm sure, are thinking, here's a personal manager. He really has his act together. Um, what is he looking for when he's signing new artists? You mentioned Glint, and we're going to hear a lot about Glint. What was it about this group, this group Glint that caught your eye and your ear and made you want to dedicate so much time to them? Well, 
in the case of Clint, uh, the, they tortured me for like three years. And I, I hated their CD. I hated it. They wouldn't leave me alone. So finally, I was like, all right, let me come and see you. I come and I see them in a rehearsal space. And it was, you know, Nine Inch Nails meets Radiohead meets, I don't know what it was. It was, it was captivating. It was exciting. The songs were fantastic. I was like, God, does your CD suck. And it just, you know, I saw a lead singer that was, a, you know, a baby Trent Reznor with a fantastic voice. And, you know, it just, you know, if I could answer that question, you know, the music just felt right. It was good. You know, I mean, how many people pass on artists and other labels sign them and they have success? And they say, where did that come from? Oh, they passed on it. All right, so you sign a band like Glint and you say, okay, guys, I'm willing to manage you. Um, at what point then, so what are your first steps? You know, from, from your perspective, you're starting with a band that nobody knows, um, unless in that region maybe they're, they're known. But what, what are you doing to, to break them to whatever, you know, level you want them to be? Well, I mean, the hardest thing is, is uh, you know, is, is social media now because that's the cluttered space that you have to figure out how to break through, and that's something that we're working on with some really unique ideas with Clint. But in the case of them, was you know just getting and playing around New York City, or you know two years ago we went to Europe, and I couldn't find an agent, and we booked the tour ourselves. And by the end, they were playing in front of five thousand people at an outdoor festival in Amsterdam, and. All of a sudden, all these agents were like, who is this band? Who booked this tour? And it was just, it's just hard work, you know? It's just getting out there playing live. At what point, from a um, technical standpoint, as a manager, because uh, in New York and California, I guess legally a manager is not allowed to book gigs for his or her artist. Uh, where is the fine line there? I, I know you mentioned you had to book the gigs because you, you couldn't get an agent, so there's like a catch-22 thing going on. But is that something that you worry about, or you know, okay, to a certain level, it doesn't matter. But then once you get to a certain level, you really no. Don't. You have to be no. You you always have to have an agent, and you have to be careful. You do not want to one break the law, and two step on you know an area that other people have an expertise, and that's their job. Um, you know, when I say book and act, I mean I usually do it with you know another agent. Um, you know, in tandem. Uh, the case of Europe, though, we did ourselves. Oh, okay. And it, are the laws different in Europe Ver versus like New York or California, where it's illegal to do that? I hate to I hate to answer the question. No clue. Okay, that's totally <laughs> I fine. Don't, I don't know. <laughs> All right, but, but I, I didn't get arrested, and nobody got upset. Yeah. Bottom line is, you're not in jail, and they got an agent now. Bobby Bobby Mahoney has a question. Um, so going on the whole agent thing, I've heard people say that it's harder to get a booking agent than it is to get a record label. You know, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, well, I think there's an equal sign between both. Okay. You know, it, it's funny. When I was, you know, the head of artist development at Epic and Columbia Records, you know, I guess I fooled myself because when you're at a company as large as Sony Music and you call up CAA or ICM or William Morris or the Roots Agency, you, you know, or Ellis Industries or whatever it is, you know, when you have the power of a big company behind you, oh yes, let's 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 see this act and and I'll be the agent. When you're out there swimming by yourself and if you don't have a big label with you. It, and I've noticed it since retiring from Sony, the hardest thing, it's hard to get a record label. And, and by the way, that's a whole other subject because sometimes you don't really need a record label depending on what your end game is and goal. But um, I, I think um, getting a, an agent now is so difficult because, you know, they, they got to bust their ass 
to get you a date for two hundred dollars. They take you know ten percent, so they get twenty dollars. And and unless the momentum and the traction really gets going quickly, it's the finances don't work. So then you wind up a lot of young bands wind up booking themselves. Yeah, that's that's where we're at right now. And like honestly, I'd rather sign with a booking agent who can get us on a tour than you know label. Because right now we've been doing everybody you know, wants. Yeah, exactly. That's the thing. You want to go out and play. You know, in this day and age, you know, you can do a lot more. You can record your record without, you know, a label. But you know, without getting out and playing, you know, California or whatever. If you're a band from Jersey, it's almost impossible on your own. So, like, I have a very unique artist I work with called City of the Sun. It's it's two acoustic guitars with a guy playing uh, a Calhoun, the box. Oh yeah, you mentioned him. I think yeah, them and very different, all instrumental. It's just, you know, sexy, flamenco, it's exciting music. And we're having a hard time getting an agent. And meanwhile, we're good for 250, 300 tickets in New York. And whether we play in front of an adult act, a punk rock band with, like Andrew WK with Marky Ramone, or I play in front of, a, you know, a more traditional, you know, soulful band like Southside Johnny, I put him in front of punk bands adult contemporary, I put them in front of everything, and they knock the place out. They knock it out of the ballpark. I, I, I can't get an agent. People come and see them go, God, they're exciting. I go, Bro. So we're just going to keep playing around, and we're going to do what we've done in New York, and we're now t ready to take over Boston and Philly and Washington, D.C., and eventually somebody will knock on our door, but it's it's really difficult. It's, it's the hardest thing right now is getting an agent. Yeah. Nikki uh, Constable. I can never say her name. Constable. Constable? Yeah. There's no right. N. There's no N. I don't know. I'm okay. sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but anyway, at Nikki Costa wants to know, uh, and you kind of just answered it a little bit. Do you ever have your artists do the same live shows together? So would you ever? You just mentioned you, you'd have City of the Sun open for Southside or open for Black Violin. I think you might have said, or no, Marky Ramone. But um, would you ever have? Them all tour together? Nah, I mean it's too many. I mean, Black Violin has nothing to do with Marky Ramone and Andrew WK, and they have nothing to do with Southside Johnny. But with this case of City of the Sun, I put them opening up for Southside. Just to, I wanted to see how how that audience would react, and and they reacted very favorably to the point where what. We opened. They had that. They opened up for Southside in Anglewood, New Jersey, and then we were playing a gig in New York City. And this guy, I remembered because I sat next to him in the front row filming. See the sun. So oh, I'm from Pittsburgh. I came to see Southside, and there he was in New York to see City of the Sun, which is the ultimate, you know, compliment. This guy drove from Pittsburgh to see City of the Sun, and he couldn't get into the gig. And I was like, "Get your ass in here!" But that. I was just testing the waters um, to see, you know, in the case of City of the Sun, I mean, they work in front of almost every artist, and, and that's pretty unique because not very many people and musicians can say that. Okay. Two quick questions uh, left because we have about five minutes left. Jeanette Elizabeth wants to know, have you ever worked with artists that don't put in enough effort, and how do you handle that? Oh, okay. yeah. Uh, this is another brand. What is this? Big Bird. Thank you. Okay, just checking. It's about branding, man. You got to be instantly recognizable. Um. Oh yeah, I, I've worked with artists that are prima donnas, not motivated. Expect everybody to do everything for them. Uh. Yeah. I. I, I won't. I won't work with anyone that won't work as hard as I'm going to work, and I work 24-7, um, you know, if you're a musician and you believe in yourself, you got to, you know, be out there and and knocking on doors and, you know, sending emails like Mr. Mahoney to a manager saying, can I open up for Southside, Johnny? You got to do it yourself. If you're not going to do it, no one's going to do it for you. I can't stand, la I can't stand lady lazy artists. 
and before you even sign with them, you already have a sense whether or not they're lazy. So y you wouldn't find yourself hopefully in that situation, right? Correct. Thank but you. But I've been, but I, but I've been in that situation. Okay. Now, um, final final question before we leave is: You have an artist like Bobby Mahoney who is on my right, your left, and. Um, He's got this great opportunity coming up this weekend. You mentioned on March 28th, Southside Johnny's playing the Shade Center for Performing Arts at William Patterson, the university. And Bobby was able to send you an email. You had met him before on the Music Biz 101 and More radio show. Um, you knew who he was. So he, he was able to snag this opening slot. What are you doing, four songs? Yeah, I think that's the way he said. Yeah. Acoustic? Yep. Four songs acoustic. What should a guy like him do to take advantage of this opportunity from a music business sense and maybe even on stage and after, what would you have a guy like him do to maximize this opportunity? Well, I think some of those answers are in this wonderful book here, Managing Your Band. If you're watching this and you don't have this book, you better go to Amazon and order it right now. Uh, but what, what can Bobby do? He, he needs to make sure that every person in that audience you know, knows that he has music out there to download or buy and give every person a sticker with a website or a card or a download card or something. Cool. It's his opportunity, you know. And, and, and by the way, I'm not saying that Bobby Mahoney is the right fit for Southside Johnny, you know, yeah. but... You know, I think if it's good music, and he, and he, and I've seen him play acoustic guitar, it's they're gonna love it, whether you're you know 60 years old or 21 years old. So just make sure that those people that want to fall in love with your music don't have to go searching too hard for it. Sounds good to me. Thank you. In in closing, um, Yasmin Azir wants Yasmin Azir wants to know what the painting is behind you. Well, that that's that's uh, now we see. there you go. That's a painting by uh, that of Jimi Hendrix, and that was by a performance artist who has since passed away named Denny Dent. And what Denny would do is put on a Hendrix song, and while the song was playing, he would paint. And when the song was over, that's what it looked like. But in the case of this painting. Um, he was painting upside down, and you didn't know what the hell was going on. And then he turned it upside down, and it was Jimi Hendrix. And he was on TV a lot. He did. There's John Lennon. There's a Groucho Marx. On the other side of the room, I have a big pencil sketch of one of my favorite artists, Louis Armstrong. Danny Dent, if you look him up and Google him, you'll see some... There's another kid that's doing it that's played the Bamboozle Fest. Um, the oh. performance players. I share... And, I, and I play they're, they're, yeah, they're, they're incredible to watch. And yeah. uh, a friend of mine, interesting enough, a booking agent, Harris Goldberg, who has a, a, a company called Concert Ideas... And for close to 45 years, he's been the guy that college has come to. Because um, if you're on a college concert board, it's like you can't, you know, how are you going to get to Neil Young? Well, he knows Neil Young's agent. They'll take his phone call, and he's a middle agent. And so he middlemans dates. And when I was a college student and a college rep for CBS Records up in Syracuse, I met him at Colgate at a Fleetwood Mac Bonnie Raitt show. And Harris used to manage Danny Dent. Great. Well, there we go. Um, looks like you're going to put on your pig. Uh, there we go. Bobby's the well, king. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're a pig. Yeah, well, no, I'm not a pig, but I, I think that that you just every manager and person in the music industry is like, just be respectful and don't be a pig. And if you believe in it long term, you're going to have success. Um, but there's a lot of, as we say, chazas and pigs out there. <laughs> That's great. So, uh, oh, look what happened to me. There you go. I'm a graduate. So I do want to thank you, uh, Harvey Leeds, for 
hanging out with us for a little bit today. It was very kind of you. Thank See what we can <laughs> Yeah. Bring up the sauce. Okay. Oh, yeah. It's... There we go. All right, cool. So, thank, Harvey, thank you very much. Really do appreciate it. People should go buy tickets to Southside Johnny. They should buy the Marky Ramon pasta sauce and um, that black violin, City of the Sun, Gint, and the Chimp. Not Glint. Glint. Not Gint. Glint. <laughs> I said Gimp. <laughs> I'm an idiot. Yeah. I mean, I, I could tell you another quick story. Yeah, I'll tell you a very quick story. There's a guy at, at, at Live Nation where my office is in New York City, and he was an accountant. And he wrote a song, and through networking and networking, it wound up on the John Legend album. And he had to give up. He wrote the song, but he had to give it up, and he only owns like an eighth of the song. But this guy got a song on the John Legend album by networking, left his day job as an accountant, and is now writing and working with Alias, who's worked with Eminem. And, you know, it's just... He believed in himself. He's a great artist. I'm managing him as a performing, a performance performer and a and a writer. And you know, the most important thing in this guy's case, I said to him, "Well, what do you want to do ultimately?" And because he was an accountant and settled dates financially for Live Nation, he said, "I want to play Madison Square Garden, and I want to be the accountant that settles the date myself." Hmm. And that's a great goal, but the most important thing out of that story is that he's in the music business, and a lot of people think that you know their job starts and ends on stage. And if you really want to take hold of your career yourself, you got to be also understand the business with a capital B of music, because it is a business. the The product is much cooler than life insurance and, you know, selling cars. Well, there we go. So like, like you said, it is a business. Kuching. Kuching. Thank you, Harvey, one more time. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Pleasure. It was fun. Yeah, yeah see it. One more <laughs> Peace out, Harvey. We'll talk to you later. Cool. Bye. Thank you. Bye.